it's caught in the crossfire. It's caught in the crossfire. The mystery of room 342. The following story is said to have been taken from the secret archives of the Paris police from the time of the Great Exhibition of 1889. Several writers have told the story, it seems to have gone round the world. Here it's given for the first time in the form of conversation. The story opens in Bombay, Captain Bay, who was stationed in India, has just died leaving his wife and daughter of 17 alone in India. Miss Day, at last I have some good news for you. My dear, as you know, I was down at the officer's mess for lunch today, and the general told me that his new assistant is willing to take over the house and all the furniture as well, Miss Day. I am so delighted to hear it. Mother, I never did think it was a good idea to take any of our things back to England with us. I know you can't help thinking of Daddy very often, but I am glad we are leaving the thing behind. You would be thinking of Daddy sitting there reading and writing every time you looked at his desk. Miss Day, perhaps you are right, Joanne. But you will understand that many of these things have a great sentimental value. Miss Day, I understand, mother, but we have to begin life anew in England, and we shall do it ever so much better without all these things around you. Miss Day, I am sorry that as soon as we get to England, it will be necessary to go across to Paris and sign certain papers in connection with your father's property. I should just like to go to England and stay there. This day, I have a very good idea, mother. Many of the boats call at Marseille. I suggest that we get off the boat at Marseille and take the train from there to Paris. Then you could sign the papers, and we could continue our journey to England. In fact, it would be just as quick as going by boat the whole way. Mrs. Day, that is an excellent suggestion. John, and I think I will go down to the sh uh, shipping company in the morning to find out when the first boat is leaving for Marseille. A few weeks later at Matsai, Mrs. Day. I feel rather nervous about the hotel in Paris, John. From the papers I have been reading, it seems as if the whole world has come to Paris for the exhibition. I remember once, soon after we were married, your father and I stayed at the, at the Crayon. I think we had better go along to the post office and send a telegram for a double room. It will only be for one or two nights at the most. I would like to stay longer so that you could see something of the exhibition, but I have not been feeling very well for the last few days. Miss Day In that case, it is much more important for us to get back to England as soon as possible. I am sure that, after a few weeks in the beautiful Engle English countryside, you will begin to feel much better, and, mother, there will be other chances for me of seeing Paris later on. I am simply longing to see more my own country and to visit the places that you and Daddy come from. England is the place for me at the moment, just as much as it's for you. 24 hours later. Miss... Mrs. Day, in a few minutes we shall be running into the, the Guerre uh, de Lyon. I do hope that the Crayon uh, was able to find a room for us, I must say. John. 
that I have never been on a journey that has made me so tired. I have only one desire at the moment, and that is to lie down on my bed as soon as possible. Miss Day, poor mother, you do look tired and worn out. Still, if there is no room for us at the crayon, we should be able to get a room elsewhere, for I understand that Paris is just full of hotels. We are running into the station now. A few seconds later. Oh, mother, we are lucky. I have just seen a man with the name of our shipping company on his cap. If we are not able to get in uh, at the crayon, he will know where to send us. Calling to the man. Hello, hello there. Will you give us some help, please? Shipping company man. Why sent Certainly, uh, mademoiselle. What can I do for you, Miss Day? Mother and I left one of your boats at Marseille and are proceeding via Paris to England. We sent a wire from uh, Marseille to uh, the Crayon, ordering a double room if we find the hotel is full up. Perhaps you could recommend another one to us, shipping comedy man. Certainly, mademoiselle, I will come with you myself and explain to the driver that he is to take you to the crayon first and then I will give him the name of a hotel where you will certainly find an empty room if there is no room for you at the crayon. Miss Day, that is very kind of you. Shipping man, come, man. the pleasure is all mine. Will you please show me your luggage and then I will get a porter then perhaps will would follow me to the cab. A few minutes later at the crayon, Miss Day, I am Miss Day and this is my mother, Mrs. Day. We sent you a wire from Marseille ordering a double room, hotel crack. Yes, mademoiselle, you are very lucky indeed. We were quite full up, but just before your antigram arrived, we received another fall uh, from a client who was not able to come. It is only a single room, but we have put in an extra bed for mademoiselle, Miss Day. That is excellent. What is the number of the room? Clerk. Number 342, mademoiselle. Here is the key, and I will get a porter to take your things up to the room. In the hotel bedroom. Miss Day. Well, here we are, mother. Everything has turned out well. It could hardly be better. Tomorrow, you can go and sign those papers, and then we can catch the first train for England. Now that we are getting so near to England, I am getting quite excited. It will not be very long before we are living in our old little house in the beautiful England countryside. I suggest that we wash and then go down to the restaurant for dinner. Mrs. Day, I hope you will forgive me. Joan, if I don't come to dinner with you, I feel far too tired to eat and could not fix all the paper in the restaurant. Miss Day, I am sorry that you will not have anything. I will change and go down alone then. The following morning. Miss Day. Hello. Good morning, mother. I hope you have slept well. Mrs. Day. Good morning, Juan. I'm afraid I didn't sleep very well, but that doesn't mean anything. When you get too tired, it is often very difficult to fall asleep. Miss Day, I'm very sorry to hear that. To hear it, mother, but now I will ring for some breakfast. A few minutes later, a maid appears with a tray. Miss Day, here is a cup of tea, mother. It doesn't look quite so strong as the tea in India, but better than I expected French tea to be. Mrs. Day, thank you, my dear. It doesn't look too bad. Miss Day, you must really try it. It will do you good. And then we can start thinking about those papers that won't sign in. Miss Day, I don't feel very much like 
getting up and going out just now. I should prefer to wait until this afternoon or tomorrow morning. It w it might be a good idea for uh, for you. Went round to see the man and asked him if it were possible for him to come here. That would be much easier still. I will be all right again by tomorrow, and then we can start on the last stage of our journey. Miss Day, all right, mother. I will certainly go round and see him. But first of all, I am going straight down to see that the auto doctor comes to see you without delay. A little later, mother and daughter are again uh, talking in their room. Miss Day, the manager was in his office all right and he promised me to arrange for the doctor to come at once there is a knock at the door miss day i expect that's the doctor i will go and open the door doctor good morning mademoiselle my name is dr dupont the manager tells me that your mother is uh, is not well miss day good morning dr dupont Will you please come in? It was very good of you to come so quickly. This is my mother, Dr. Dubo. Doctor, good morning, madam. I don't speak the English language so well. I am sure you will forgive me. First of all, I will take your temperature and class, and then I can ask you some questions. A minute or two later, doctor, may I ask where you have come from? This is the... My daughter and I left Bombay after the death of my husband, and as I have some business to do in Paris, we traveled overland from Marseille, arriving here yesterday evening, doctor. I understand that you are feeling very tired, and that the appetite has gone. It's not so, Mrs. Day. Yes, doctor. To be quite honest, I felt too tired to get up this morning, and now I seem to have lost my appetite all together, doctor. Yes, madam, madam. When people are overtired, they do not feel like eating. I will send for some medicine for you. That will help you. I will see you again, madam. But now I must say adieu. To Miss Day, perhaps mademoiselle will come with me. Downstairs, Doctor, I am sorry to say that it is very serious, Mademoiselle. You must not think of continuing your journey to England tomorrow. It might be better to move your mother to a hospital. Of course, I shall arrange everything for you, but Mademoiselle, it will be necessary for you to go at once to my house and fetch some medicine for your mother. I am very sorry, Mademoiselle, that my house is at the other end of Paris. It is very unfortunate that I do not have a telephone in the house. The best and quickest way would be for Mademoiselle to go to my house herself. I will give uh, Mademoiselle a note for my wife, telling her what to do. Miss Day, that doctor, if you leave so far away, wouldn't it be much quicker to get the medicine from a chemist? Doctor, mademoiselle, this is a very uh, special medicine of my own, and it will be much quicker for you to go to my house for it. You may trust me, mademoiselle, that I will do the very best for you. Now I must write a note to my wife, giving her instructions and then I will get a cup that will take you to my house and afterwards bring you back here with the medicine. The doctor wrote a note, give it to the girl and having uh, got a cup for her, uh, giving the driver instructions, the girl was very impatient, especially as the cab seems to crawl along as slowly as possible. She got the idea that the doctor's house was at the very end of the world. Several times she thought that the cab was going in the wrong direction, for when she looked out of the window, she was certain that 
they were going along streets that they had already been through once. At last, however, the cab stopped in front of a house. The girl go out and rang the bell. She had to ring the bell several times before the door was opened. Miss Day, good morning. I am Miss Day. I have a note from Mr. Dobon. Mrs. Dobon, good morning, Mademoiselle. Please come inside and sit down. I am Mrs. Dobon. I will see what my husband has to say. She reads the note. I will attend it. Attend? To it at once, mademoiselle, but it will take some time to prepare the medicine. Will not you sit down until it is ready? The wit seems to have no end. Hundreds of times she got up from the, her chair and walked to the door of the room and then went back and sat down again. Sometimes she felt like running back to the whole mother without the medicine, but having come so far for it, she waited on, she was surprised to hear the telephone ring because she remembered the doctor's word that he had not got one. The long wait brought tears to her eyes as she thought of her mother lying in bed at the hotel waiting for her at last. However, the medicine was ready and she went out to the cab. The driver back to the hotel was even slower than the drive out. And when they got back to the center of the town, the cab driver stopped outside the hotel that was unknown to her. She now felt certain that something was wrong. A few yards away, she noticed a young man who, to, 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 to judge by his clothes, could not be anything else but English and although modest by nature, she jumped out of the cab and ran up to him. Miss Day, excuse me for addressing a, perf uh, a perfect stranger, but you are English, aren't you, stranger, with cordiality? Oh yes, I am English, all right. You look worried. Can I help you in any way, Miss Day? My name is Miss Day. My mother and I are staying at the Creon as uh, she was not very well. This morning, I got the hotel doctor to see her. He told me that it was serious and sent me off to his house at the other end of Paris to fetch some medicine for her. I just don't understand things. The doctor gave the driver instruction and he drove as slowly as possible, very often driving. I am sure in the wrong direction, for we drove up several streets more than once. Then I had to wait for ages at the doctor's house. While the medicine was prepared, the doctor said that he could not phone his wife as he had no phone. But while I was waiting, I heard the telephone ring in the next room. Then on the way back, the driver drove slower than ever. And now, instead of taking me back to the crayon, he has brought me here. I just can't understand it all. Stranger, I will introduce myself. My name is John Bates. I am a junior secretary at the embassy here. I will come along with you as far as this, the crayon, for it does all sound rather strange. At the crayon, they find the doctor of uh, number 342, looked and go down to the clerk. Miss Day, can I have my key, please? Clerk. Whom do you wish to see, mademoiselle? Miss Day, I registered here last night with my mother and we were given number 342. Please give me my key, clerk. But surely you are wrong, mademoiselle. You could not have come here yesterday evening. It must have been some other auto. What did you say was the number of the room, mademoiselle? Miss Day, number 342, clerk. But I don't understand, mademoiselle. For number 342 has been taken by my, uh, Monsieur Lee. He often stays at the hotel. He is a very good friend of ours. Miss Day. But I did register here yesterday evening with my mother 
I demand to see the registration papers which were filled in the, by people yesterday, clerk, as you wish, mademoiselle. But you will certainly find that you have not registered here. She goes through the previous day's registration papers several times but fails to find those filled in by her mother and herself, clerk. Is mademoiselle satisfied now, Miss Day? No, I am far from satisfied. As a matter of fact, you were the one that gave us the papers to fill in. I remember you quite distinctly, on account of that ring you have on your finger with the blood red stone in it, clerk. But I never saw mademoiselle before in my life. Perhaps mademoiselle is not well. It's very hot today, Miss Day. My mother wasn't well this morning, so I made the manager arrange for the doctor so to call and see her. Both the doctor and the manager will remember me. Will you please call the manager? No. Speaking in a tone of resignation. If you think it will help, mademoiselle, I will call the manager. The clerk returns with the manager, who does not seem to recognize her either. Bates to Miss Day. Don't you think the doctor who is in charge of your mother would recognize you? To the manager. Perhaps I had better introduce myself. John Bates, a secretary of the British Embassy here. I think that I must insist that you call the doctor. After 20 minutes, wait, the doctor appears. Doctor, I understand that Mademoiselle and the Monsieur wish to see me. In what way can I be of assistance to you? Miss Day. Oh, doctor, I have now got the medicine for, uh, for mother. Have you seen her again? Can you tell me how long it will be before we are able to continue our journey to England? I don't understand these people at hotel, at the hotel. They say they have never seen me before. Tell them, doctor, that they are wrong. Tell them that you saw my mother in room 342 this morning and then sent me to your house for some medicine for her, doctor. I think you must be suffering from the heat. Perhaps I could arrange to get something for you. You are looking extremely white and nervous this day. But doctor, what about my mother? Don't worry about me. How's my mother? Will it be necessary to send her to a hospital? Doctor. I am sorry, mademoiselle, but I have never seen your mother until a few minutes ago. I have never seen you either, but I should be pleased to have you, Miss Day, turning to John Bates. Take me away from here, otherwise I will go quite mad, just like these people here. John Bates, who is quite sure that the girl is telling the truth, although he does not know why he should be so sure after hearing the clerk the manager and the doctor at the auto takes her to a small restaurant here with much uh, difficulty. He succeeds in getting her to eat a little while uh, at the same time she tells him the whole of the story from the time of the death of her father in India until the happening of the same morning base. Now, Miss Day. I will tell you at once that I believe every word of your story and I am prepared to do everything I can to help you to be true. I am only a junior secretary at the embassy, but I am sure that they will help too before I tell them the story. I think it would be a very good idea to be able to prove as much of it as possible. Now, what I suggest is this, you must stay somewhere while we are looking into things. I have got a room at a hotel. It is quite a small one, but it's clean and cheap. I am sure I could get them to find a room for you there. As soon as you are fixed there, I suggest we go to see the shipping company by whose boat you travel to Marseille. We can get them to confirm that you and your mother were passengers as far as Marseille. We can also get hold of, of the man from the shipping company who helped you at the station. Through him, it might be possible to get into touch 
with the cab driver who drove you to the crayon when we have this information. I can go to the people at the embassy and get them to do something. Miss Day, gratefully. Oh, Miss Bates, I don't know how to thank you. After listening to those people at the crayon, I almost began to think that I was mad myself. It's so nice of you to trust me. I think your idea is excellent. But when I went to the doctors this morning, I didn't take my purse with me, so that I am now entirely without money. I hate to uh, mention it to you. I have never before had to do such a thing in all my life. Bates. You needn't worry about the art of bail, for I can get the people at the embassy to look after that, and I will be pleased to help you until you have time to see the man who has the papers which your mother was going to sign. Miss Day, I think you are wonderful, Mr. Bates. I don't know how I will ever repay you for your kindness, Bates. I am only too glad to be able to do a little for you, since we are going to work together for a time. Wouldn't it make matter easier for you to drop the missile Bates and start calling me John right away? Miss Day, alright, you call me John then. Bates, spend the afternoon in taking the talking to the shipping company, their representative who was at the Gare de Lyon, and the cab driver, the cab driver, all confirmed the story the girl had told him. He then placed the matter before a senior of, uh, official of the embassy. Of the, embassy. The, the same evening at the hotel, Bates, now, John, I want you to think hard and tell me exactly what furniture was in the room 342 at the crayon. The embassy is going to arrange through the French police to get permission to look at room 342. Perhaps tomorrow, Miss Day, I remember the, cur the curtains very distinctly. They were cream colored. Then the chair were covered with uh, some red uh, material. The wallpaper I can also remember for I didn't like it. It was cream color too, and was covered with big red roses. The bed was just an ordinary wooden bed, nothing special about it. They are the most important thing that I can remember. Bates, that's quite enough. The following afternoon, Miss Day is waiting at the door of their hotel for the return of the of the of Bates. After a long wait, he appears. Miss Day, or oh John, do tell me if you were able to arrange the matter with the French police. Bates, yes, John. The first secretary of the embassy arranged everything. We went to the Grillon this afternoon, but found that everything in the room was quite different from the description given by you. The curtains were blue and white. The chairs were covered with grey material, and the wallpapers was white and had many small flowers. But now we come to a most surprising thing. The wallpaper had only just been put up. I noticed one or two places where it was not yet quite grey. Miss Day. Oh, John. What can it all mean? I wonder where poor mother is. I have got the idea that I shall never see her again. Bates. Cheer up, John. We will get to the bottom of this matter, even if it should take us weeks. When we had finished looking at room 342, I thought it might be a good idea to try and find the name and address of the man who does the paper hanging for the auto. It was not very easy, but as usual, a little money helped. So I suggest that we got round to see him as soon as we have had some dinner. Later in the evening at the paper hanger's shop. Paper hanger. So you want to know if I prepared the room at the crayon yesterday? 
I cannot understand why you should be interested in my work. It's, it's very important for this lady to know. And if you did, which room it was? If you're hungry. So, it's important for this young lady to know, uh, is it? Well, like all good Frenchmen, I should be pleased to help a nice young lady, but these are hard times, and paper hangers are not overpaid for their work. Bates, I know that room 342 was prepared yesterday, I was there this afternoon, and saw that the paper was not yet quite dry. What I really want to know is whether you can give us any information, if the information were worth it, I should be ready to give 25 francs for it. Paper hanger. Well, for a nice young lady and uh, Bates. You mean that for 25 francs you might tell us something? Alright. If you have anything to tell us, the money is yours. Paper hanger. Well, I was sent for uh, suddenly yesterday morning when I got to the crayon. They were busy moving furniture out of the room. Number three, four, two. I was told to put up fresh paper as quickly as possible. I tried to find out the reason for it, monsieur. For it's, it is not only women who are curious in this world, no? Nobody could or would explain anything to me. That is all I can tell you, Bates. Here is the money. I think you have earned it. Are you certain that another 25 franc would not help you to remember still more? Paper hangers. If I could tell you any more, I would do it for the sake of the young lady. A fortnight later, Bates. Well, my dear Juan, I have now tried all the servants at the crayon who might be able to tell us what happened. I cannot get a word out of them. There are probably very few that knew the truth, and they have been well paid to keep their mouths shut. Miss Day. I have given up all hope of ever seeing mother again. You have been wonderful to me, John. Without you to help and comfort me, I don't know what I should have done. Bates. Nothing has ever given me greater pleasure, John. I am not looking forward to the day when you go to your father's people. In England, I shall miss you, John, but I hope to make you stay a little longer. There is still one chance left of being able to find out what happened. The first secretary told me today that he is very friendly with one of the heads of French police. This man has been in America for some time, but he will be returning in four or five days. The first secretary thinks that he will be able to get the true story out of him. When not you wait, Juan, until the two of them have had a chat about the affair, Miss Dave. Oh, John, although I know that I shall never see mother again, I should feel much happier if only I knew what had happened to her. It would seem strange to go back to England to daddy's people and tell them that I had just given up. Of course I will wait. A week later, Bates, with a very serious face, the first secretary has talked to his friend in the police this day. Oh John, I can tell from your face that the news is not good. I will try to be brave. Tell me the whole story, just what really happened. Bates, you are very brave girl. The best I have ever met. I am afraid you will never see your mother again. Well, er, Miss Day, tell me, John. I will try to be brave, Bates. Well, then I must tell you that the doctor who came to see your mother recognized at once that she was suffering from the black blood. He sent you off so that he would have time to remove your mother to hospital. Your poor mother died there that afternoon. The French did not want the news of your mother's death to get into the French papers. The exhibition had started only a short time before, and they were afraid that the news of the visitor dying of the black black would cause Paris to 
be empty of visitors at once. It was agreed that the whole thing must be kept secret. Miss Day, poor mother, and yet I am glad that I know, I now know the truth. I will try to forget the troubles I have had in Paris. I shall be glad to get to England. That will help me to forget. Bates, I hope. Bates, I hope you will not forget everything connected with Paris, Joan. Miss Day, no, John. I will never forget you, Bates. I shall not give you the chance, Joan. In a month's time, I will be coming to England on 